Alrighty, I am here today with Carissa Co, a grant writing unicorn in the collective. And we are having a very interesting conversation today because she's using my own game on me and she has asked to do an informational interview with me. So this will be very exciting to see what kind of questions she wants to ask. Okay, so let's pull off sort of the, the switch of who's host. So okay. you are now officially the boss and I am going to be interviewed. So go right ahead. So Meredith, I am, you already know how the informational interviews run. So I'm not gonna start with all that. But my first question was, I, I was reading through your LinkedIn actually. And what you said, my forte is turning ideas into reality. So how do you kind of move from your ideas from the idea stage um, to the reality stage? Like how do you not get lost and overloaded and like with a lack of direction? That's kind of, that's something I struggle with. So that's why I wanted to ask. Ooh, juicy, beautiful <laughs> question. Okay, how do I not overload? Can't answer that yet. I am in the thick of <laughs> overload figuring that out. <laughs> But I can answer how I go from idea to reality because we're very, very good at that and we execute beautifully. So what I have found is in the ideation phase of anything, you need to not limit yourself to thinking within boundaries and getting too technical mm -hmm. about what something's going to cost or how long it'll take to do it. And it's, it's just dreaming big. And the way I like to do that is off of the computer. So when Alex and I are ideating, it is always with post-its, it's standing up, it's using a wall, a whiteboard, going to a space that we don't typically work in. That's where we gather and create the environment for creative idea generation. Mm -hmm. Then I always take it to, okay, well, who am I serving and go ground truth it. So what, whatever you're doing, like for instance, mm -hmm. we're actually examining this other business idea we have right now. And we're doing informational interviews with 30 other women business owners. And it's, you know, we have some ideas on what a solution could look like, but we have set that aside to just mm -hmm. listen to what their needs are and where they're stuck and allow ourselves to still remain open-minded to a, what a solution looks like. And frankly, that's how the collective even came to be. I didn't come up with the idea that this is how it should look and function. That was all a product of speaking to people like yourself. So then you do, though, have to break that down into actionable steps. And this is where project management comes into play and is such a fundamental aspect of even being a grant writer. So what we find helpful is basically sketching out what needs done and then parking when it gets done in Asana. So we'll, if it's a specific project, it'll get its own Asana project management board and you really work through the tasks and just take the time to think through what has to be done. And all that upfront planning pays huge dividends. And we just did a podcast about the weekly big three and quarterly planning. Yes. Did you listen to that? Yeah, I did. Okay, <laughs> That's kind of partially what inspired this question. But yeah, yeah, because what's fascinating about when you really stop and do your quarterly plan is you'll realize like, oh, wait, we're supposed to film the phase six videos. When the heck are we going to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So it's, it's important to zoom way out because you'll see, you'll get real about how long it takes to do things. And I also found you can really only get super granular for eight weeks at a time. So even though we plan quarterly, we also reboot every month at the end of the month. Mm. So we're going to start Alex and I'll do that again on Monday where we like go back into a sauna and look at our quarter and like dial in the next eight weeks. And we'll do it in February, dial in the next eight weeks. So it's sort of like start big and you just move down about 5,000 square feet yeah. <laughs> until you get to the day level. And I think that's how we do it. And just really taking the time to do the upfront planning is the kicker mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to then have wiggle room on the other end of that, because things always take longer than you think they will. <laughs> yeah. I am bad at like estimating how long stuff will take. Yes. Oh, yes. That's I great. think it's a human experience. We all are. <laughs> so because mm -hmm. we know that we're also bad at it, we just plan in a buffer week right. every eight weeks. Okay. Like a whole week. Yeah, that makes sense. Literally a whole week of nothing is planned, but we know that the reality is a bunch <laughs> probably did get pushed there that are loose ends that need tied up. No, that's a good idea. Cause I've always like tried to plan on each little thing, how long it will take, mm -hmm. but like also giving yourself a whole week yep. in case everything goes down. That makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I guess debating whether I should skip to one of my later questions, because you mentioned um, you're going to be um, talking to other women CEOs. You said mm -hmm. that in your email. 
what are some of the questions that you're planning to ask them? Well, or have been asking them. <laughs> totally. I feel like I'm the one breaking the rules, big surprise, but we did prep just like we teach you with your mm -hmm. informational interviews. We prepped a Google doc with several questions. I could even yeah. pull it up and have a look, but it's sometimes it's not always easy to stay on script when you start speaking with people and you realize yeah. that there are the individual too. I want to kind of go explore their own path and pain point. And then it, but it can, it can sometimes lead to the conversation not being as focused as I would like. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm great at that, but essentially that's how we do it. It's just like prepping the questions and what we're trying to examine, like the theory in that is, you know, Alex is the integrator. I am the visionary. And we feel that there is an opportunity for people to that identify strongly with operations and project mm -hmm. management to become integrators, to find out that that is a career path option. You could go work with a visionary like myself that is, has lots of great ideas and can execute fairly well, but like does need that other person that, that strengthens their weaknesses. Right. And so we're curious if we can train up grant writers from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah can we train up integrators from scratch? Hmm. So that's the question we're trying to derive answers for and what we're trying to pull out of these interviews. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause like I hadn't ever heard of like the integrator and visionary mm -hmm. language until again, it was on your LinkedIn. I was like, what is that? And I started Googling it. Yeah. Um, cause I, I don't know how familiar you are with like MBTI and stuff like that. I'm that's, not. No, what's up? Oh, ooh, that's exciting. It's like the Myers Briggs type oh. indicator, you know. Yes. You are. Yeah. yeah. I'm an ENFJ. Um, <laughs> okay. I was thinking you're either ENFP or ENFJ, but I didn't know yeah. one. So that's really cool. Okay. I'm, a, I think either INFP or ENFP. I kind of go back so and forth. You're going to laugh at this, but I can never, I could never remember what the letters were. Like, it just did <laughs> yeah. not stick in my brain, which maybe is an ENFJ trait. So, <laughs> so yeah, the way I remember it is I, mm -hmm. I decided it, it stands for engineering for joy. <laughs> it's just like my weird way of being like ENFJ. <laughs> Do you know what Alex says? Is? I wonder what hers is. I'll ask her. You know, her. she's the exact same. Oh, really? That's it's interesting that y'all have the same like kind of personality but different like work styles. Yeah, I know. I couldn't believe that we had the exact same because we do work very differently. Oh, okay, cool. No, mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I really <laughs> that was a short question. I was like, I wonder. Yeah, we actually, it's something we want to do in the collective because I'd be so fascinated. I know traits of successful grant raters because mm -hmm. interacted with thousands, but I am really curious if, if we could have everyone do the Myers-Briggs or the 16 personalities test and figure out, it, are there some massive trends yeah. between mm -hmm. what makes someone successful and not? And so that's something we've been thinking about. So maybe in the next yeah. couple of months, we'll, we'll roll that out in the community group. In college, we had a lot of like those self-development, like that's testing quizzes. And um, <clears throat> I also like, you know, strengths finder, that thing's fun. Um, there's one called via character strengths. That's mm -hmm. probably my favorite. It's free. Um, and it gives you like all 36 or whatever. And it's more, whereas I think like strengths finder is more work oriented. Sure. The character strengths one, I feel like kind of, um, it's like life oriented. And that's why sure. I really like it though. I can, you, that one. can you send yeah. me all of those? And I would yeah. love to have a pitch from you on if we <laughs> were to roll out a test mm -hmm. to all the members in the collective and maybe even just people all on our email list too, as a way of like, who's in the collective and who's not yet. Yeah. How would you structure that? And I would love to know how you would do it if you were in our shoes. Okay. Yeah. That's, I could definitely think about that. Sweet. <laughs> I'm glad you're recording this so I could like, I'll go back and like re-listen and think yeah, about it. Totally, but, um, totally. I guess along another thing, like in that whole self-development realm, we talked a lot about like core values and like mm -hmm. how you use those to make, I guess, decisions in your personal life. Could you talk a little bit about like what you think your like personal values are and like how that kind of um, influenced your like business values? Ooh, it's such a good one. Okay. <laughs> so what I found when I established the business, what was that the values of the business were really the values of myself. Right. Yeah. So that was taking responsibility, leadership as a core value that we all develop it within us and to work hard, but recognize that today is all we have. And what I have come to realize with the influence of Alex on the culture of learn grant writing, mm. think about how much she influences when someone shares a win, she's always asking, how are you going to celebrate? Yeah. And now each other, we, we asked that to each other 
Like if someone announces mm-hmm. a win, someone else might say, but how are you celebrating? Yeah. No matter how big or small that is, because women in particular can be so bad about slowing down long enough to eat a cupcake and celebrate the fact that you just had a killer informational <laughs> interview, right? right. Yeah. So that is a core value that I actually swapped out. And if you look at our website now, I, I removed mm-hmm. work hard because that's actually sort of in contrast to what we're trying to really embody, which is it's not about just grinding yourself into the ground. Right. It's about finding that, that, that balance, that joy, that health. And so, so now the values of the company, I feel like are truly representative of both Alex and I, yeah. so my personal core values. Number one is health without it. Nothing else. Yeah. Right? That's true. Uh, taking, on that one. <laughs> right? yep. Yep. taking responsibility is huge. I think it is the secret to success because if you never blame someone else for anything happening in your life and you always take ownership for it, you can't help, but, but mm-hmm. find, but take responsibility and find joy in that. Like, cause you can't blame anyone else. And you realize, okay, this is a learning opportunity. I'm going to derive better outcomes because now I've reflected on this and I can do better. So that's huge. Um, making each move count is a value. Got that from my dad out in the hay fields. And the idea is behind that really is just be, a, be intentional. We, all we have is today. So let's make sure we're making each move count. I, I read that. I was like, dang, like that applies to so many things. Like even just like, oh, I, this is stupid, but like cleaning, like if you're going to walk across the house, bring something with you, don't yes. like make each literal move count. But literally, <laughs> like literally the physical movement. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And probably the last value that I'm trying to (laughs) cultivate in myself Mm. is that has been inspired by others is generosity. Mm. So I feel that I can be, I just want to make sure that I'm, I I think I am a very generous person, but Mm. I do think it can, it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Like how can you be generous, not just with perhaps your time and your energy, but the experiences you create and how you, you anticipate what someone might need before they might even know they need it. Mm. So yeah, those would be, those would be the four values that I'm in, I'm embodying. And I think it's a super important question to have. I actually am a big fan of like, I guess the, the difference though, is that the values are what you kind of fall back on when you're reflecting on how you're going to handle a situation. But what I like to have is a question to use as a decision-making framework as a model for deciding. And then the values help kind of nudge that to the finish line. So for example, the question that I've had since I started my business five years ago was how do I, how can I build, does this activity move me towards having a million dollar a year business? So few women hit that milestone. And Mm -hmm. so when you think about how you spend your time and your energy, I can sometimes say that does not move me towards a million dollar a year business. This is absolutely a huge waste of time. Yeah. But I also apply that to my personal life. So the question that I have as a theme for this year is, does this person and or situation make me feel secure? When you are secure, you're your authentic self. When you're your authentic self, you can attract and draw into your life everything you want. And so I'm being very, very intentional about who I allow into my life the role they get to play, how I spend, where I physically put myself, the right? So that's, I think, a very useful takeaway that you might ponder would be, and everyone, anyone that might be listening to this would be, what's your question to frame a, your decision-making? Does that make sense? No, it does. That yeah. is, and that last question you posed, I'm like, oh, like, I don't know, I guess, you know, being in this kind of transitional phase of life and figuring out, like, who are my friends going to be now that I'm not in college? Who do I want to work with? Who do I, you know, like my partner, like, it's just, that's, yes. that's a very good question. So no, me, your questions are great. So oh, good. Okay. I'm like, yeah. hmm, prioritize which questions, which okay. oh, prioritizing is hard for me. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I guess on that, like what advice would you give to, you know, a recent college graduate just starting out their career? Um, whether that be kind of more along the ramp rider like lane or more like, a, ugh, I can't, um, the entrepreneurship <laughs> like lane. <laughs> yes. So the advice I have that I want to stand on the top of a mountain and scream is, mm-hmm. can you guess, do informational interviews. Oh, true. <laughs> yes. I mean, really what you're doing is genius. Think about how much information, the insights, the little yeah. bits of wisdom, the connection, 
now I know you more. Now I feel more connected to you. And right. right? And that's the power of these informational interviews. And it literally is the reason every amazing job opportunity I've had, every opportunity in general came from informational interviews. And I continue to do them to this day because it's how you authentically and genuinely build your network with people you actually want in it. So when I worked as a full-time grant writer at an engineering firm, we were in this beautiful, fancy building and the CEO of the big native corporation that owns that building drove a beautiful car and she always looked so fancy. I mean, she's (laughs) such a boss babe, right? I mean, the way she physically held herself, you just knew this woman is a force. And I always wanted to informationally interview her. I would see her in the building and I just wanted to, but I didn't do it. And so I took this challenge, the informational interview challenge that we're both in. And I said, enough is enough. Reach out, make, ask to have an interview when we're scheduled for next Tuesday. Oh, wow. (laughs) And I'm so excited. Right. And it just goes to show I can bring her now. Hey, I want to learn her story. And then I'm going to bring you know, really premeditate on what are the two to three challenges I'm facing that I think she could give me advice on. Right. And so the model continues to work, whether you're right out of college yeah. or at any age, really. And it's, a, and probably the next one that I should hold myself accountable to was the CEO, the former CEO, he retired of the company I was working for I mean, This was a 30,000 person firm. Right. I wanted to interview him so badly and I chickened out and didn't send, didn't send the request. Yeah. And now I'm thinking, no, you need to do it. You need to go back and do it. Reach out. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You say, no, he's probably retired and has more time on his hands now anyway. <laughs> right. No, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, cause I kind of almost didn't, the guy that I've just talked to, I almost didn't email him because I'm like, yep. Oh, like I know him. Like they probably already have great writing. Like but, and he was, when we talked, he's like, no, actually I don't. I'm like, why was I so scared to email them? Like, especially yep. if you know them, like, and that's not what turned into is him just giving me advice, yep. which if that's the goal, like of the conversation is just to like learn from them, then that's, you know, the best outcome. So it right. is, it is. And that's the best place to start is not going into it thinking, what can I get from this person? It's what right. can I learn? Do they have a need? Can I serve that need genuinely? Does it excite me? Right. Yeah. And it's just so much more genuine of a value exchange. Right. Rather than feeling like forced. Exactly. Um, let's see. I have like one or two more questions. Yeah. Go right ahead. Um, yeah, I guess we kind of touched on this earlier, but what's the most important quality you look for in someone who wants to be like an entrepreneur? You threw me a tough one. Good on you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. well because I was gonna say grant writer but I feel like I kind of no. know you're into that one, no so. it's not that yeah entrepreneur <laughs> that's great the most important is such a tricky question I guess I'll come up with a couple that I'll share Your favorite yeah a few yeah. <laughs> so funny. I would say problem solving mm, yeah. and grit because the thing about entrepreneurship is that it's a journey it is a journey you don't mm. even know what you don't mm. know I remember being told it takes two years for a business to really get under its feet and be profitable. And I thought, yeah, but they weren't as smart as me. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do it in six months. <laughs> no, it took two years. It took two years. Obviously I was you know, making money. I was paying myself. I was pulling it off, but it wasn't like truly chugging along and, and scaling. So I think recognizing that it's a it's a path. If you don't expect quick wins and you're someone that's willing to keep digging in deep because you will get knocked down, you'll get knocked flat, but you get back yeah. up and you keep going. The other thing, this would just be, I suppose, just a bit of advice. And this is a mistake I see a lot is not failing fast enough. <laughs> There's two reasons this happens. Our ego gets in the way. People know what we're doing or we don't we don't want to give up yet, even though we're not getting the traction that we should be. And, and it's our own ego that's in the way of just saying, this isn't working. I need to try something else. And that even goes to the extent of, okay, maybe you hired your first contractor, but they're really not great. Well, fail fast and let them go and move to the next person. Right. right? And I think sometimes we get so hung up on hurting people's feelings or this or that, but when you're an entrepreneur and you're just getting started, you don't have the cash to be dinking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to make decisions quickly because you won't be in business otherwise. Right. 
So I, yeah, I would say the character traits that are most important are you're hungry to solve problems. You have a growth mindset. You believe you can tackle anything if you put your mind to it and you're gritty um, and you're focused. Mm-hmm. I'm at the point in my career personally too, where I've, I've wanted other things and that I wanted to work on and they're all kind of coming in right now. And I have never for the last four years, five years, four, I have been laser focused on build a grant writing business, build a grant writing business. And I have not allowed anything else to come into that space really. But the reality, and that's, I think why we're succeeding so, so well, because we just buckled down and did not let ourselves get distracted. I heard a great analogy once where we get, imagine you have six soccer balls. You've heard me say this one, I'm sure in a coaching call, but I'll say it again. So you have six coach or six soccer balls out on a field. You get six kicks. Are you going to kick each one once every day? So it goes forward one spot and then forward a second kick and then Mm -hmm. a third kick, or do you pick one ball and you kick it six times? And the second day you kick that one six times. And now it's at 12, 18, 24. Well, that Mm -hmm. one ball is way far further ahead of the rest. And you can take that win and then you can come back and find to find the second ball that you want to start kicking. Right. The grant writing unicorn collective was a side hustle. The consulting business was my first soccer ball that I kicked until I was like, okay, I've got enough money saved up. I think I can come back for that second ball. I want to kick, which is building Mm -hmm. an online course and community. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I feel like I, if I thought about it, I'll probably give you a better character list, <laughs> but mm-hmm. hopefully that's a good starting point. No, that is. Um, what's the, the third ball you want to kick? I guess now you have a lot of options for balls. Is that yes. what's happening? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So I have, mm-hmm. I have a dream of a piece of property I really want in mm-hmm. Spokane, Washington. It's where I went to college. It's a community that I care about greatly. And it's a very interesting and tough challenge to get something that I can't afford, that I can't, I don't have necessarily any answers for how to unpack it, but I love the complexity of the challenge. And I believe I'm well suited to do it. And that not knowing how to do it, but knowing you want it and you're going to do everything in your power to get it. To me, this is going to be one of the most exciting tests of a bunch of the books I've been reading this year. One of them is super cheesy. The title is terrible, but I'm just going to share it anyway. It's Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Okay. Old school book. But the whole point was you have to visualize, see what you want, believe it is yours. And if you want something bad enough, you will make it happen. But you have to want it. Right. Right. You have to want it. You can't be waffling on like, yeah, I want it. I'm going to do the work. Right. Yeah. And that's where I'm at with this. Where I'm like, I will do anything in my power to make this dream happen. And so I can't share all the details on what the vision is for that, but I just know that that's, that's a big dream. Um, Probably the second, the second, you know, maybe the fourth ball, if you will, is, (laughs) is figuring out this, this visionary integrator concept that Alex and I are kind of curious about. We have no idea how that should manifest. I don't know if I'm really interested in building another course business. It takes a lot of heart and energy and effort. And like, you know, I still am a full-time dedicated to the collective and then some Mm. with my time commitments, but we do feel like sort of what interests us is that maybe if grant writing isn't right for someone, Mm. or is there another career path that's under the um, unicorn lifestyle umbrella that we can recommend you go to like, oh, so grant writing wasn't quite right for you, but you do have strong project management skills. Maybe you want to be an integrator. Yeah. Or maybe you want to be this. And so we're curious about who are other, the way Alex described it yesterday was if you think about it, like a constellation, what other inspiring women entrepreneurs each have their own little bright light and they're a star. But if we connect each other, like a bit of a constellation or a web, how much more powerful is that? Yeah. So, so many ideas. It's out of that's exciting (laughs) though. Yeah. And it might change, but like, it's, that's, I don't know. I've, it's scary to put your idea out before it's like ready, but Mm -hmm. then also like putting your idea out makes you more inclined to do it. So I don't know. It's very, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's definitely a fine line. The book I would recommend reading 
frankly, we should make it sort of mandatory reading for everyone in the collective, <laughs> or I need to like rework it into a grant writing esque version, but it's called The Mom Test. Okay. By yeah. Rob Fitzpatrick. And it is about that, that if you just say, hey, here's my idea, do you think it's a good idea? <laughs> well, if you ask your mother, she's going to say, of course, honey, it sounds great. And everyone will too, because they don't want to hurt your feelings. But it might actually be a terrible idea. So there is something to with withholding and mm-hmm. testing and doing customer discovery and investigating before you are egotistically committed to an idea. But yet the reason I share my dreams pretty openly more than I think the average person is because I do want, oh, there's a cat. Yay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love it. Is that I want, I do want the universe to know my intention and what I'm trying to accomplish. And I do think there's a lot of value. And sometimes someone has like that, that next little node of connection. That's very valuable. So Mm -hmm. I'm personally like an excessively openly wide book, but I'm also unafraid to walk away from something that fails. Right. And so, but it is something that you have to walk a fine line on. Yeah. This has been a wonderful interview. I sure appreciate your questions. You threw some good curveballs.